Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all had a great lunch. It's a very good pleasure of mine to be here speaking with all of you today. Um, and thank you for being here. We're going to discuss the avian respiratory system. And the avian respiratory system, as you all know, our birds are very special and unique, but they're more than just special for their personalities. Their anatomy is very special. They are unique in the animal kingdom. Um, their main function of the respiratory system is gas exchange, the um, exchange of oxygen in tissues and the removal of carbon dioxide, just like it is in mammals. Um, they do have a thermal regulation function, um, which deals with water conservation, is also a function of the respiratory system. And they do have a non-respiratory function that involves vocalization. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to start um, with the upper respiratory tract, and then we're going to move down into the lower respiratory tract. Um, up on the screen, I've got a basic diagram of what the respiratory system looks like. And we're going to start and go through each basic component of the system. We're going to explain uh, what it is, what its main function is, and a little bit about its structure. And then after that, just so you realize just how unique and special the bird's respiratory system is, we're going to compare that with mammals, which would include humans. Um, as you can read up here, these are the basic components of the respiratory system that we're going to discuss. And we're going to start with the nasal cavity, which is basically the beginning of the respiratory system. This is where the air will enter the respiratory tract. Um, birds can breathe through both their nose and their mouth, just like we can. Um, this is actually a photograph of a chicken. And you can see right here is the nasal cavity. Um, some birds do have um, operculum, which covers and protects the nasal cavity. There is a significant amount of species variation among most of the components of the respiratory tract. Um, I'll mention this to, from time to time, but I don't think time is going to allow us to go into you know, the diversity of all the differences. Um, I'm going to try and stick with sort of the cytosines and the passiviforms and try to keep sort of a, an average of all the respiratory systems. So here we have the nasal cavity. This is an air passage where the air is brought into the respiratory system. Other than air passage, the other main function of the nasal cavity is filtration. There is a mucus carpet that will collect airborne particles such as microbes, bacteria, viruses, dander, pollen, things like that. And it is swept by way of cilia on the endothelial lining. It sweeps it back to the coanal slit in the roof of the mouth and then back into the oral pharynx or the back of the mouth where it's then swallowed and processed. Behind the nasal cavity, you have the nasal pharynx, which is sort of the back part of the nose. And there are some structures in there called the nasal conchae. When there's, most birds will have three of them, as you can see here. Um, the nasal conchae are part of the respiratory system that helps with water conservation. Basically, the nasal conchae increase the surface area which air has to travel through. Um, as the temperature increases, the amount of water vapor that can be held in saturated air increases. So as you transverse down the respiratory system, um, the amount of water that can be held is increased. Now, body temperature is higher than what you have in your nasal cavity. So the bird's nasal cavity is cooler than at body temperature. Now, if this air were to be expelled at body temperature, all the water um, condensation that was collected as it went down the respiratory system would be lost. So these nasal conchae, by increasing the amount of surface area that the air has to flow through, it cools it down and water condensates, therefore conserving water. As you can imagine, this is vital for desert birds who probably have no source of water other than um, maybe their food stuff or oxidative metabolism of it, and also migratory birds. The main limiting factor for distances of long distance nonstop flight is, is water. So this is how birds are able to survive in desert habitats and also how they're able to um, migrate long distances without any water source. So air comes in through the nasal cavity. It passes through the nasal pharynx into the oropharynx, which is the back of their mouth. And then it's going to go through the larynx, which is the structure that you see right here. 
Here is the opening, which is the glottis. The larynx has muscles which control the glottis by opening and closing it, and the main function is to prevent extraneous particles from entering the lower respiratory tract. And then that connects directly into the trachea. The trachea is probably my favorite part of the respiratory system. I know that sounds so weird, but there's just so many cool things about it. Um, birds have complete tracheal rings that are almost osteophyte in some species, and they're actually um, broad at one end and narrow at the other, sort of like a signet ring, and they actually interlock. And this increases, um, sort of strengthens the trachea. Um, since birds use their beaks for things other than food manipulation, they also build nests with it, they preen themselves, some have oil glands. Um, their necks need to be longer. So their tracheas are actually 2.7 times longer than that of a comparable sized mammal. And when I say comparable sized mammal, I would be comparing maybe say an, an Amazon to like a guinea pig. So it would be a mammal of the same size, because obviously a horse's trachea is going to be significantly longer than a rat's. So the same with a bird. A crane's going to have a much longer trachea than a parrot. So I will say comparable size mammal quite a bit. Um, now, having a longer trachea, when you bring air into the respiratory system, it's going to increase the resistance significantly, which would be very difficult for the birds to deal with. So to compensate for this, their tracheas are also about 1.3 times wider. So they have a significantly longer and wider trachea than that of mammals. And we're going to talk a lot more about the trachea a little later. Okay, from the trachea, which in this diagram is going to be right here, we come into this um, structure known as the cernix. Now this is unique to birds, and this is the main sound producing organ for the birds. So if you've ever known anybody who didn't know a lot about birds and said, can I have my bird, you know, debarked or desquawked or something, of course you can't. And this is why, because the cernix is actually completely um, integrated into the trachea and then it bifurcates into the two primary bronchus. Um, it's composed of cartilaginous membranes along with flexible membranes that will vibrate as air passes over them. The complete mechanisms of how sound is produced is still not completely understood. There's still a lot of people studying it. Um, however, and especially in songbirds, you'll see the interclavicular air sac right here actually um, will work with the cernix to produce the sound. So it's a process of not only the cernix itself, but um, the interclavicular air sac as well. So from here, it's going to bifurcate into the two primary bronchus, which you can see right here. So now we're going to start getting into the lower respiratory tract. This is a diagram of the avian lung. And from here, you can see the trachea is right here. And now we're going to go into the primary bronchus, which is this long tube right here. Um, the primary bronchus, once it enters the lung, will actually branch off into four groups of secondary bronchus. You have your medial ventral, your medial dorsal, lateral ventral, and the lateral dorsal are really shown in this diagram. Um, the and then from the secondary bronchus, they will branch off into tertiary bronchus, which are also, which are actually called parabronchi. In humans, we call them tertiary bronchi. In uh, birds, we call them parabronchi. And the parabronchi is where the gas exchange is actually going to take place. The avian lung is another very um, different and unique organ from that of mammals. It's um, non-lobed. It's rigid. It lies dorsally, so it's going to be along their back. Um, it's triangular to quadrilateral in shape, and I think I mentioned it, it's rigid, it doesn't move. Okay, and now we're going to get into the air sacs. Um, most species have nine. The, um, I think the domestic fowl has, I think the cervical are fused in fowl, so they'll only have um, eight. And some songbirds will actually have um, three of them that are fused together. So the number of air sacs does um, differentiate between species, but pre predominantly there's nine air sacs. So we have a pair of cervical air sacs, which are right here, and these um, lie next to the trachea. Then we have one large um, either clavicular or interclavicular air sac. 
whichever you prefer. We have a pair of anterior thoracic, anterior, where did you hear? Oh, those are the lungs. <laughs> anterior thoracic, no, I'm sorry. Um, anterior thoracic, posterior thoracic, and then the abdominal. So these are all paired. So all the air sacs are paired except for the clavicular. And here's a diagram of the air sacs in a bird. Again, we have our paired cervical lining the trachea, clavicular. These are the lungs. See how they're dorsal? They're located towards the back. And anterior thoracic, posterior thoracic, and the abdominal air sacs. Basically, air sacs are thin membranous sacs that are poorly vascularized. They do not um, participate in gas exchange. Um, and they do comprise about a little bit over 50% of the volume in the respiratory system. And what they do is they act as bellows to draw the air into the lungs and to push it out. Okay, so the respiratory mechanics are a little bit different than that of mammals. Um, birds don't have a diaphragm. So rather than using the muscular contractions of the diaphragm, they're actually gonna use their intercostal muscles which will pull on the sternum, wishbone, and the ribs, which you have right here. And these dotted lines will actually show what happens during inspiration, where the sternum will actually be pulled down and out, the ribs are pulled laterally, and the wishbone is pulled out too. And what this does is it pulls on the body wall and actually creates a slight negative pressure, which will then fill the air sacs. And then the muscles will contract again, push the air sacs in, and then the air is expelled out. Okay, so that, those are pretty much the main components of the respiratory system. And now we're going to get into the differences between the birds and the mammals. And we're going to basically focus on the trachea, the lungs. Again, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the respiratory mechanisms and the muscles involved, air volumes, the pathways, and then we're going to compare um, the gas exchange areas between the birds and the mammals. Okay, so back to my favorite trachea. As we mentioned before, they, birds have complete cartilaginous rings. Again, we have the broad and the narrow and they interlocked. Now, humans or mammals also have cartilage in their trachea. However, it forms a C-shape, which you can see right here. This is the cartilage in the trachea. And the posterior end has a tracheallis muscle. So, birds have more support in their trachea, which makes sense because their trachea is longer and wider. Um, and also, this allows you to restrain birds or carry them around their neck. Um, a lot of the herons and egrets that I've worked with, I'd actually hold them around their neck and carry them. Um, and when I worked with um, Dr. Backus in Florida, we used to have usually be new bird owners, and they'd come in, and I'd be holding the bird in a little towel or something, and I'd have my fingers around his neck, and it looked like I was choking the bird. And the people would always be looking at Dr. Backus like, uh, is, is she going to kill my bird? Is she choking my bird? So then we'd have to explain to them that their tracheas are a little bit, have more support than us people, so I can actually put a decent amount of pressure around their neck and not cause them any problems. Now we mentioned um, before about how the trachea is longer and wider. Because of this, they have about 4.5 times more volume of air coming in their trachea. This is a significant amount. Um, we consider this air dead space because there's obviously no gas exchange occurring in the trachea. And this is a large volume to overcome. So to do this, birds breathe both deeper and slower to sort of compensate for the amount of dead air that they have in their tracheas. The lungs, again, we have the same picture that we did before. Whoops. Oh, sorry. Um, of the lung and we have our, this is our trachea, and then again we have the primary bronchus and our secondary bronchi which then branch off into our parabronchi. In mammals, here's the trachea, and then we have our primary bronchus right here which then branches into secondary and then the tertiary. Um, as you can see here, the lung is lobed. Um, the lung is, a, is much bigger in mammals than it is of comparable size birds. Birds have about a 25% smaller lung volume than that of humans. So right there you'd think, well, maybe they don't have as good of a system as mammals, but um, I'm going to show you later how they do. 
The other thing, um, anatomy-wise, is since the lungs are located dorsally in the birds, um, the heart is surrounded by the liver rather than the lungs as in people. So in humans, the heart would be right here. So the lungs lie on either side of the heart in mammals, and in birds, the liver actually lies on both sides of the heart because the lung is pressed up to the back. Um, I mentioned before that birds don't have a diaphragm. Um, the diaphragm in humans and mammals would be located right here at the base. Uh, what happens is during inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and pulls down. This creates a slight, well, actually more than slight, it creates a negative pressure, subatmospheric pressure inside the pleural cavity, which then draws air into the lungs. Then the diaphragm relaxes, the pressure goes up, so you get a positive pressure, and then air is expelled from the lungs. So in mammals, exp um, inspiration is an active process. It requires contraction of the diaphragm to pull air into the lungs. However, um, after contraction, the diaphragm relaxes, and that pushes the air out. So expiration is a passive process in humans. Now in birds, they don't have a diaphragm. There's no separation into thoracic and abdominal cavity. They basically have one giant cavity that's at uniform pressure. And they need muscle contraction for both inspiration and expiration. So this is a significant difference for mammals. And this is a reason why if you're holding a bird, you cannot hold them very tightly around their their body because you could actually constrict that muscle and they can't bring air in and out. So you can suffocate a bird easier by holding them around their body and not by their neck. And um, this is just another diaphragm. Here's the diaphragm and you can see this is just one giant cavity, the lung being up here. And there's just one cavity, whereas in mammals, the diaphragm actually separates the thoracic and the abdominal cavity. So now we're going to get into the airflow pathways of the birds. And what we have here is your trachea, and there's the cernix, which is then going to bifurcate into the two primary bronchi. Um, here we have our clavicular air sac. The cervical air sacs would be over here and aren't, actually aren't in this photograph. Um, and then you have your anterior thoracic, posterior thoracic, and the abdominal cavity. And these structures right here represent the lungs. So diagram A is inspiration and diagram B is expiration. During inspiration, the air is going to come in through the trachea. About half of it is going to travel through the primary bronchus all the way to the end of the bird into the caudal air sacs, which would include your posterior thoracic and your abdominal sacs. So half the air is going to go straight through the primary bronchus into the back end. The other half is going to go through the primary bronchus into the secondary bronchi, and it's going to go in through the lung and begin gas exchange. So on inspiration, half of your air is going to the back, and the other half is going into the lung. And some of that air may actually get into the anterior air sacs. Now on expiration, the air from the caudal air sacs is going to go into the lungs. Air from the anterior air sacs is going to go out through the secondary bronchi into the trachea and will be expelled. The main thing that you need to notice in this diagram is that the airflow through the lungs is unidirectional. It's only going in one direction in both inspiration and expiration. And this is one of the reasons why birds have such a um, sufficient gas exchange capabilities because they have air constantly going through, fresh air constantly going through the lungs. And I have another. And here's another diagram. Again, this would be the trachea into the primary bronchi. And here's your lungs and your anterior air sacs and your posterior air sacs. So you can see again that the airflow through the lung is unidirectional. In this diagram, we've got, here's your trachea, and this is the primary bronchus, which goes all the way to the back. Um, your pos this is your abdominal air sacs, posterior, anterior, cervical, and this is the clavicular. Now, all the secondary bronchi are directly connected to an air sac. So here you have your medial ventral air sacs, or I'm sorry, bronchi, 
which connect into the cervical, the clavicular, and the anterior um, thoracic. So all of these secondary bronchi actually connect into the air sacs, and your lateral ventral connect into the posterior thoracic. Now the primary bronchus travels directly completely through the lung all the way to the back and empties into the abdominal air sac. So the abdominal air sac is the only one that isn't connected to the secondary bronchi. And right here, this darker area, I think that's labeled number, I can't see that, six. Um, that's the parabronchi. That's where the gas exchange actually takes place. So here we have the mammalian um, air pathway. Here we've got the trachea, and then we go into the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, and then the tertiary bronchi. And over here, these would be your bronchioles, which are actually will come off of the tertiary bronchi, into your terminal and respiratory bronchioles. These large clusters here, these are the um, alveolar sacs, and inside you have these tiny little pockets of um, alveoli. And this is where the gas exchange takes place in mammals. Um, this is a dead end system. They have tidal ventilation. The air is going to come in, gas exchange will occur, and then the air is expelled. So you have mixing of fresh and old air. And you know, the, these are the dead end guys. So compared with the birds, so over here we have the mammal, which is our alveoli, and over here we have the parabronchi, which are what the birds have. And you can see right here where these errors are. This is the airflow going through the parabronchi. It's open-ended. They all kind of connect with each other. There is no dead end. So you do not have mixing of old and new air. You have constant fresh air going through. And then birds have a cross current flow, which means you've got air growing in this direction right here, and you've got your blood supply going in this direction. So they're going in opposite directions. Air flow is going that way, and the blood flow is going the other way. And then what happens is branching off of the um, parabronchi, you have air capillaries that go down like this, and then you've got your blood capillaries coming up this way. So you actually have right angles. So they kind of intermingle like this. So not only do you have the constant airflow going by, but you also have exchange occurring at right angles, which is sufficiently more um, efficient than what we see in the dead end alveolar system in mammals. Um, so overall, um, birds have a much more efficient system. Part of this is due to the fact that they have air sacs which are constantly bringing um, air in, so they have a constant volume of air going through the system, which is different from mammals where we have it coming in and then being expelled. So there's constant, constant volume going through the lung. Um, the cross-current exchange um, will get um, oxygen loading levels much higher than what any mammal can get. As well, birds have a greater exchange, surface area exchange. They can pack more of these tiny um, air capillaries into a small space. And the thickness exchange barrier is much thinner. So the combination of constant air volume going through, the cross current flow, the higher surface exchange area, and the thinner capillary membrane um, gives birds the energy that they need for um, long duration flight flight at high altitudes, and this makes them much more sufficient to handle this kind of activity than mammals, and this is why they can do it. So I think I did that pretty quick. <laughs> so if anybody has any questions. That's a really good question. I had a feeling somebody was going to ask me that. Um, a veterinarian would be more better at answering this. Now, I have had, I was a rehabber, and I did have a lot of birds come in with punctured air sacs. And normally, the only way I would know was that usually it would be somewhere around the neck area. They have this, this huge pocket of, of air blowing out. And um, I normally put them on antibiotics and stuff, but I can't really think of any that I ever had survived. Um, now, I have seen parrots, I think, that have had punctured air sacs in um, the clinic that I worked, and they seem to be doing okay with it. I think a lot of the wild birds probably don't because 
if they had a punctured air sac, probably something else happened to them and they had other underlying causes. Um, but that's probably something a vet could answer a little bit better. But any other questions? Yes. I kind of missed the first part of your question. Just wondered if there were any sort of uh, treatments for lung ailments for birds, or if it's that it sounds like new ground that research. Um, medications and treatments for lung ailments. Um, a lot of the um, lung problems we see in birds are usually either going to be bacterial or fungal. Uh, funguses are, you know really scary because they're very difficult to get rid of and since they can actually extend into the air sacs you sort of have a multi-system problem. Um, antifungals vary in their effectiveness. I know nebulizing tends to help birds with fungal infections. Um, in my experience usually when there's a bacterial infection we'll just put them on you know appropriate antibiotics. Um, I think for fungal infections and nebulizing works and also sometimes we'll nebulize them with bronchodilators to help them and sometimes put them on steroids and things. Um, but since they do have the air sacs, respiratory system problems are a little bit more difficult to treat than what they would be in mammals, um, being that they do have the air sacs and stuff. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you.